Well, good morning, church. It's great to see Kingsway family here today. Um, as Pastor Phil already mentioned, a lot of new faces. So if we haven't met yet, my name is Arlena. I serve on staff here as one of the pastors. I primarily oversee uh, our life groups, which I'll talk about that in a moment, and Kingdom Builders, which is our missions uh, program. But uh, at the beginning of my message, I just want to say a special welcome to those of you that are visiting. Maybe you're here for the first time, just popping in on a Sunday. Those of you that are online, uh, everyone in the room, can we welcome our first-time guests, our online family? We love you guys. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, two quick announcements I just want to remind you of. I mentioned this before. Today is the last day to sign up for a life group. So if you want to be in a life group, and if you haven't gotten into one, it is not too late. Uh, sign up on the app or the website. Listen, um, we want to help you engage in community. Um, you need it, and we need you in it, all right? So it's good for you, and it's good for us. So make sure you check out all of the groups that we have available. A lot of them are meeting for the first time this week, so you haven't even missed the first group gathering. So it's not too late. Stop by the tent if you have any questions. Ask your moderator in the chat uh, feed there if you uh, want to know more about that. And then I do want to make sure you know that this Tuesday night, February 7th, is Taco Tuesday. And uh, it's right here in Cherry Hill. It's when we talk about and give you information for our four mission experiences this year. We're going to, if you want to know about Bulgaria, Turkey, uh, the Los Angeles Dream Center or El Salvador, you need to come uh, to Taco Tuesday, all right? You'll get to meet the leaders, hear the cost, all the information, what next steps are related to that. So we would love to invite you to that. Well, today kicks off a brand new series at Kingsway Church. I'm excited for this. It's really an honor and a privilege uh, to get to start and kick the series off. Uh, we are going to be doing a series called One Another, and for the next four weeks, we're going to dive into what it means uh, to get our relationships with one another right. At least we're going to be aiming for that, all right? Uh, we can't get them perfect, but we can aim for right. And I, I thought, as just a preparation for the message today, I thought I would Google uh, funny quotes about relationships. And I found a few that I think are worth sharing with you today. Here's the first one. Relationships are a walk in the park, Jurassic Park. <laughs> you know that tingly feeling you get when you like someone? That's your common sense leaving your body at that time. Yeah. Relationships are just two people constantly asking each other what they want to eat until one of them dies. That's what relationships are. Uh, love is telling someone their hair, their hair extensions are showing. Um, and this is my favorite because I would want this to be true. I want someone to look at me the way I look at coffee. So, uh, and if you don't drink coffee, I don't, I don't know, I can't help you today, but uh, no, I do love coffee. <laughs> I do. Of course, these quotes focus on romantic relationships, and those are not the only kind of relationships we have. And the series isn't only about those that are in romantic relationships. Um, we have relationships with our friends, with our family, with our coworkers, our colleagues, our neighbors, um, and even in the church here. We are, are connected relationally. The, the Bible says that we are part of the body of Christ. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so the second commandment that Jesus gives us is that we are to love others as we love ourselves. And he didn't leave us to sort of stand around and say, hmm, what does that mean for you? And huh, how, how, how do you work that out? And he actually modeled it for us in the Gospels. And he made sure that we understood fully uh, what that actually looks like to love each other. And then he had all the New Testament writers uh, write about it as well. Give us some instructions on how we're to do that. And sort of the theme verse, or not sort of the theme verse for the whole series, is really taken from uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, for the life group team, for all of us serving in life groups, hosting, leading, coaching, this is our theme verse for the year. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. We've been charged with building each other up. And throughout this series, we're going to look at several different ways that we can do exactly that because we believe that Jesus helps us get relationships right. Amen? We really believe he helps us in that regard. So today, I'm tasked with focusing us on love one another, loving one another. What does that mean? Why are we to do that? How are we to do that? 
And the primary text for um, that concept, that idea, is found in 1 Peter 1, And it says this, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply. Say that with me. Deeply from the heart. So the progression is clear. So you've come to faith. You've experienced forgiveness through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. You've yielded your life to obeying him. You want to follow his steps. You want to follow his example. Now we actually have the capacity and the ability to love one another deeply. And so when I read that verse, I'm like, okay, Lord, you want me to love imperfect, insincere, sometimes disagreeable people, and that's just the people I'm related to, but you want me to love them deeply, because the standard isn't politeness or respect, although those are important. The standard isn't that surface level love. You know what surface level love is? Surface level love is how you love your sweatpants. Come on, somebody. That's, that's surface level love, but we're to love people deeply, And so when I was thinking about this topic, two questions came to my mind. The first one is, why are we to love one another deeply? Why does Jesus ask us to do that? And the reason is Jesus wanted the distinguishing characteristic of Christianity to be love. Let me say that again. Jesus wanted the distinguishing characteristic of Christianity to be love. At the nine, someone came up to me. They were kind of crying and and they said something, what I thought was really profound. And it's true. This is the ball game, folks. We don't have anything to offer the world unless we can love the way Jesus loves. Seriously, we're not going to outproduce or out-entertain or out-accomplish anyone or anything else. Love is the deal. And how do I know that? Jesus says this in John 13. He says, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That's a convicting verse because when you think about the last three or four years, would the world look at the capital C church and say, oh, they've loved so well, they must belong to Jesus. It's very convicting, very convicting. Matthew 5, 43 to 44 says, you have heard the law that says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, this is Jesus speaking, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What? Galatians 5, 6, for when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, when we claim to follow Christ, how we love matters deeply. There is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. So it doesn't matter if you come from a church background or you don't come from a church background. It doesn't matter if you know all of the Bible or none of all. What is important is faith, what you believe, expressing itself in love. Now listen, historically, and this is a message to the church today, by the way. I probably should have said that in the nine as well. These words are directed to those of us who claim to follow Christ because that's how he's called us to live. And so sometimes in the church, we've not gotten this right. We've been so dogmatic, and then we've not loved well. But kind of where we are at now in the church is now what's happening is in the name of love, we're compromising truth. And when we dilute or change the truth of God's word in the name of love, then what we're saying is that we love people more than God loves people. And that's crazy. That's just insane. There's no possible way you and I could love people more than God does. So I think if we unpack 1 Corinthians 13, we're going to find the why we are to love one another deeply, why it's important that we love each other deeply. And you might know that passage of scripture. It's read at a lot of weddings, but we're going to dig into especially the first eight verses. So, Why are we to love one another deeply? Well, number one, without love, all I say is ineffective. Look at this verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 1. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, 
I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Come on, Ben, hit those cymbals. All right. It's brash, right? It's a little cringeworthy. I, I knew it was coming and it was still cringeworthy, right? That's what we sound like. That's what we sound like when we speak without love. It's ineffective. And listen, we live in a toxic, opinionated, vulgar, critical culture. And listen to me, friends, the church sometimes isn't much better. I knew I would get a lot of amens on that one. We have, we have, we have glorified opinions and commenting to the point that where if I disagree with you, I now hate you and you need to die. That's where it's at. This is very real. And I'm calling on us, church. I'm begging us in the name of our Savior to stop the language that's coming out of our mouth, to stop the things that are coming out of our fingers, all because we claim to know the truth. But I'm right. You know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because Ephesians 4.15 says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk, the NIV says unwholesome talk, come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. When you speak, is it gracious? Listen, without love, all I say is ineffective. Do I dilute the truth? Of course not. Of course not. But we have to speak the truth in love. In love. Without love, all I know is insignificant. Verse 2 says, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries, but have not love, I am nothing. So listen, our world is getting smarter all the time, but we as humanity, we're not much better for it. And this verse tells us in that first half there that you can have prophetic powers, you can have insight, you could predict the future, you could understand all mysteries. Think about some really deep mysteries. You could understand all of that and unpack all of the mysteries that exist. And it is insignificant if all of that is possessed without love. Without love, all I know is insignificant. Without love, all I believe is insufficient. It's insufficient. Look at the second half of verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 13. I've already read this part. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Think about that. Think about having a faith so robust that you could actually do what Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20. You could actually say to a mountain, go from here to there. You would have that kind of explosive, powerful, admirable faith in Jesus. And the writer here is saying, God is speaking through the Apostle Paul and saying, listen, you can have that kind of faith, but the devil believes in Jesus too. And if you don't have love, it's nothing. It's nothing. So without love, all I believe is insufficient. Without love, all I give is incomplete. 1 Corinthians 13.3 says, If I give away all I have, but have not love, I gain nothing. The amount we give isn't important. It's the heart behind it. The heart that we're giving as we give it to, to whomever we're giving it to. Other translations read, If I give away all I possess to the poor, which is a noble thing to do. It's not an insignificant thing to do. But without love, I gain nothing. Nothing. Without love, all I give is incomplete. Without love, all I accomplish is inadequate. The second part of verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 13, if I deliver my body to be burned, eh, but have not love, I gain nothing. The NIV reads, if I give over my body to hardship. Listen, do you know that we as believers, our lives are going to be audited? The Bible calls it judgment. I know that's not a popular word to say, but there's going to come a time when how I have treated, loved, and served people 
is going to be evaluated not by people that like me, not by people that hate me, but by God. Now listen, I want to make this very clear. This has nothing to do with our salvation. My entrance into heaven, my entrance into eternal life, it only comes through faith in Christ. It only comes through what Jesus did on the cross. You can't earn salvation. Jesus has already done that for you. All right, so there's nothing attached to the gift of salvation. There's no work. But if I am saved, if I claim to follow Jesus, then there is going to be an evaluation, a judgment of how I lived. And I'm going to get rewards or not going to get rewards based on that. It's going to be linked to what I live and how I, how I do with loving others. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every single one of us. So that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So my sins will be under the blood of Jesus. But what did I do with this life that I have? How did I love people? How did I treat them? How did I serve them? That's going to be weighed. And it matters to God. It matters to God how we love one another. So why are we to love deeply? Jesus said it's the distinguishing mark of Christianity is love. All those reasons in the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13, what we say is ineffective, what we give is incomplete, what we accomplish is inadequate, what we believe is insufficient. That's the why. Now here comes the sticky part. How? How do we love one another deeply? Because I think all of us would agree, I mean, I think most of us, I mean, maybe if you're having a really bad day, you're like, I don't really want to love people deeply. <laughs> but I want to aspire to that. I don't have any problem with the why. The hard part for me, and maybe for you, is actually doing it. It's actually doing it. And so I would just suggest to us today that we make the choice every day to love the way Scripture calls us to love. Now, I'm not going to unpack these because sometimes I think we read the Bible and we're like, oh, what does that mean? There's more to it. There's mystery. There's deep meaning there. And sometimes we just need to read the Bible and let it say what it says. And this is one of those instances. I mean, I guess maybe you No, I don't really think you can misconstrue what's being said here. First Corinthians beginning 13, beginning with verse four. How are we to love one another deeply? We're to be patient. Love is patient. We don't like it, but we all know what that word means. (laughs) I looked it up in the dictionary just to make sure I knew. It was worse than I thought. Listen to what this word means. (laughs) Bearing provocation, annoyance, misfortune, delay, hardship, and pain. Bearing all of that with fortitude and calm and without complaint or anger. That is how we are to love one another deeply. Love is kind. Can we just be kind? I know we wear it as a badge of honor in the Northeast, our level and degree of rude and sarcasticness. I know we do. As someone who grew up in the Midwest, but now has spent 30 years here, I embrace it. I'm in. But can we just be kind? Can we just let the person go ahead of us? Can we not fight for what in light of eternity probably doesn't matter anyways? Can we just be kind? Love does not envy. An antonym for envy is contentedness. How are you content? Will you just be grateful for what you have? I don't know about you, but I am blessed far more than I even remotely deserve. And if you ever go on a mission experience with us and see how other people in the world live, you're going to realize you're even more blessed than you think you are. Love does not boast. It is not proud. Those two go together. So we feel pride, so we boast. Right? So pride is the internal thing. Boasting is the external thing. 
Love does not dishonor others. So let's do this. When the urge comes over us to really put someone in their place, why don't we just not? Why just we not, not do that? Why don't we just say, you know what? I don't agree with that person, but they are created in the image of God. And Jesus did, in fact, lay down his life for them. So why don't I just choose not to dishonor them and give them that honor if I can't give them any other? Love is not self-seeking. That means I choose you over me. How do we love one another deeply? Well, we're patient, we're kind, we don't boast, we're not pride, prideful, we don't envy. I'm not self-seeking. This was the one that got me this week. Love is not easily angered. This week I got really angry a couple of times, truthfully. And I didn't just get angered, I got easily angered. Have a bit of a temper. Really struggled with it when I was young in the Lord. But kind of mellowed out a little bit. And it always happens this way. You know, I'm preparing a message and there's always really something that God wants to kind of put his finger on in my heart. So you may think it's easy to be up here and talking about it, but then just means that I get the conviction about three or four days ahead of you. That's all, that's all it means, really. <laughs> anger is a human emotion. We're, we're going to feel angry. The issue isn't with feeling the anger. The issue is what you do with it. And this week, I, I got angry. I was loud, and I asked people that know me in the room, please don't aim it, it's too loud. But I got a little bit of a mouth on me. And I did. I just, I just, and then I, I felt convicted because I'm, like, I'm getting easily angered. Like, I'm just, and listen, there's reasons why that happened, and they may be justified. But I just, I felt the Lord kind of put his finger on that and say, love is not, Easily angered. And so I went and looked up every verse in the Bible on anger. I don't know if you know this or not, but the Bible talks a lot about anger. A lot. And here's what's interesting. There's these lists in the New Testament of all of these really bad sins. And we talk about these ones all the time. But in that same list is anger and fits of rage. So we talk about these being really, really, really bad. But we never talk about this one being really bad. And in God's eyes, it's the same. It's the same sin. And so when I made my, in my journal, you, you, if I let you see my journal, which I won't, by the way, but if you saw my journal, page after page of verse after verse that I'm making myself write out about anger. And this is the one, this is the one that stayed with me, is in Proverbs 14, 29. And it says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper it exalts folly. So basically, whenever I'm easily angered and I have a hasty temper, I, I increase the stupid quotient in the world. That's what happens. Listen, we don't need any more stupid in the world. I don't need to be adding any more folly to the world. Love is not easily angered. How do we love one another deeply? Love keeps no record of wrongs. Do you know that God, when we repent and we come to him, and ask for forgiveness, God keeps no record of our wrongs. Psalm 103, 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How do we love one another deeply? Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. How often do I root for evil instead of truth? Because evil is more aligned with what I want and my way and what I think. How do we love one another deeply? Love protects. And it's qualified there. Do you notice the word that's before that? Always. Love always protects. There's not any stipulation on who deserves protection either. It just says it protects. Love always trusts. Listen, sometimes people aren't Trustworthy. I know that's a news flash for everyone. But when I struggle to trust a person, I just choose, choose to trust God for that person. I, I can't muster enough trust on my own to begin with, but God, I need your help. And so I'll just choose to trust you with that person. Love hopes. The biblical word for hope is faith. And love chooses 
faith. How do we love one another deeply? It's a great one to end with. Love always perseveres. Perseverance is the steady persistence in a course of action, a purpose or a state, especially in spite of difficulties, obstacles, or discouragement. So the summary of all of that, of all that love is, we need perseverance to be able to do that day in and day out, to make the choice day in and day out, to read over these verses and go, how do I love people deeply? How am I supposed to, how are we supposed to love one another deeply? The way first Peter says, This is how I'm supposed to do it. I'm supposed to be patient and kind and not envy and not boast and not have pride pride and and, and not be self-seeking. And I'm supposed to protect and I'm supposed to persevere and not be easily angered or keep record of wrong. That's how we are to love. It's that straightforward. The sticky part is we really struggle doing it. I know I do. Maybe nobody else in the room does. Maybe nobody online does. So why are we to love one another deeply? Why? Because Jesus wanted the distinguishing characteristic of Christianity to be love. To be love. And how do we we love one another deeply? Well, we roll up our sleeves and we get right into 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8, and we just do it. We just do it. That's what he's asked us to do. For the series, uh, we've decided that every week we're going to kind of offer a challenge to you because it's easy to hear something like this. And the Bible says we're to be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And it's easy to say, okay, well, what am I to do? And we want to give you a very clear action step of what to do. So you're going to see a QR code on the screen. You can take out your phones, uh, maybe snag it. Um, you can do a couple things. I don't know if you know this or not, but you can take a picture of a QR code and go back to it later and press it and still get to the link. So some of us, you know, we're going to go right to the link and then our phones are going to go off or whatever. But listen, what we want you to do is we want you to accept the challenge. And on your way out today, you're going to get handed one of these cards. It says, God loves you. And it's for the challenge. You're going to need this in order to do the challenge. So go ahead, get out your phone, snag that code. Take a picture if you need to, get it later. I, I know, again, I think I said this earlier, I know what I've shared today is something that we all aspire to. I hope we do. The problem isn't with our desire to do it. The problem is that we fall so short on the execution. And I know that's hard to hear. I, I, I know. It doesn't make us feel really good inside when, we're, when we hear we're not living up to the way God wants us to live. But listen, there's hope. Today, because we can ask God for help. God is love. God is love. So there's no one that knows how to do it better than God. And we just have to ask him. He says, if we ask him, he'll help us. So we bow your heads and your hearts with me because I'm going to do that. I'm going to ask God to help us to love one another deeply. So Jesus, we come to you. And we just ask for your help as a church, as a people as people who claim to know you and follow you, that you would help us to love one another deeply. That you would remind us that our knowledge is insignificant, our words are ineffective, even what we believe is insufficient if it's not characterized with love. It's not given with love. I know we like being right. I know we love proclaiming that we have the truth. And we do. Uh, Not above anybody else, but you are the truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. That's true. God, love doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not self-seeking. We don't hold ourselves as morally superior to others. We love people deeply the way you have called us to love them. Patiently, kindly. So help us. Let Kingsway, at least our little portion of the Capital C Church, let us love one another well and in line with your word, I pray. We need your help, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen.